Victor Purton here. Welcome to the Centre for Optimism's Optimism Cafe. Uh, and today I'm delighted uh, that Tyson Yanker Porter, um, he, the teacher of Indigenous culture and knowledge at Deakin University, and just as importantly, the author of Sand Talk, How Indigenous Thinking Can Save the World. Uh, Tyson uh, agreed to come and join us uh, just last week. Um, and it's a, a fantastic opportunity uh, to engage with one of Australia's most interesting thinkers. So Tyson, um, in these um, Optimism Cafes, the first question we always ask our guests is, what makes you optimistic? Oh, what makes me optimistic? Ah, oh, usually propaganda and the mass manufacture of consent will, will sort of <laughs> nudge me in that direction. <laughs> I've kind of got a different idea of optimism um, to most people. It's tied up. It's tied up with notions of time and the way we perceive time and how we live in it. Um, it's a bit different from if you're living on a linear kind of arrow of time with this uncertain future rolling out ahead of you. And you live in an economic system that, um, that kind of demands predictability and scalability and all these kinds of things, then your view of the future is a little bit different. And um, yeah, and, <laughs> and in order to uh, be compliant and enthusiastic about that, you, um, you know, you, if you're on the left side of politics, you have hope. And if you're on the right side of politics, you have optimism. And <laughs> optimism means, you know, yeah, we're, we're gonna open back up for business in, you know, April kind of thing. America's open for business. Don't wear a mask. Don't worry about that. That's, that's optimism. Um, <laughs> and then hope is like, oh, I hope it'll be over soon and we can get back to normal. Um, hope, hope and optimism are both basically, you know, mechanisms for like yearning for a, a future over which you have no agency and um, settling for your images of that that yearning uh, rather than any um, real action in the present. So yeah, I, I believe those things are mechanisms that have been installed um, by the self-organizing system of liberalism in order to keep the, uh, the old monster going for a bit longer. Although of course, Gramsci and um, you know, the revolutionary <laughs> optimists from the thirties and the forties. So optimism is actually um, also used by the left. Um, Probably the greatest opponents of optimism are actually the conventional Catholic churches, which teach that you have to have faith and op hope, but that optimism is a man-made construct. So I think the Pope would agree with you on optimism yeah. as a man-made construct, but would say that hope and faith are the things that should drive humanity. Yeah. Yeah, it's strange in that way. It's, it's weirdly conservative hope. And, and I guess, well, um, optimism would be what the mega churches uh, are pushing, you know, big front door, <laughs> everybody come in, you know, oh, you got cancer, oh, your wife died, you, you piss off, you, you, you're ruining our vibe. <laughs> yeah, although, again, Paul Cooper will be joining us later, but, you know, we, hard, you know. <laughs> the, um, Harvard uh, and others have all said that optimism is the key to healthy longevity. But what I, I really, I mean, I see, because from my liberal perspective, reading your book, it fills me with optimism and hope. So thinking about indigenous culture and where we're at at the moment with the pandemic um, and moving beyond that, what's your belief about indigenous culture, indigenous wisdom leading us as a community and this community of people who are with you today through the pandemic and beyond? Well, I, I guess it's just, um... It's, it's the ways of thinking just kind of sneaking in there. So I, I don't know. I, I think, um, I don't think there's much hope and optimism in my book. And, uh, but it's funny, a lot of people are reading it and saying it fills them with hope and optimism, <laughs> but I think it's filled them with something and I don't think they have a word for it. <laughs> so, and it's something that kind of is replacing hope and optimism. And, um, my, my feeling that started to emerge, I was sleeping on this last night to try and figure out what it was that was going on. But my feeling is that it's, um, 
it's something more akin to what the, the Stoics, uh, their philosophy around acceptance, you know, um, because that's a very strong part of the Aboriginal uh, worldview. You know, the Aboriginal ontology, cosmology is this acceptance of change uh, and an acceptance of the ending of things. Um, you know, I've seen old fellows who <laughs> are standing by a sacred site that's just been bulldozed. And, um, you know, you'd expect this intense grieving to happen, but there's just a, they stand and look for a while and then they go, mm, that's finished. Mm -hmm. That's finished now. And then they go fishing. Yeah. You know, <laughs> um, and that's neither hope nor optimism, but there's a, a kind of an acceptance yeah. um, uh, of change. And an embracing of things emerging that are um, interesting. And, and I guess, you know, your indigenous lens to answer your question also, it just gives you a holistic view of things that allows you to see context and see patterns and, and so to see further and to, to kind of extrapolate in the now in a way that might be thought of as predictive, you know? Um, so I don't know, I was just, the last words I just spoke to my woman before I come in here, um, first of all, I told her what I was doing and I said, Center for Optimism and she laughed her head off and she said, they've got the wrong fella. <laughs> 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 they don't want to be talking to you, <laughs> you know, because um, I'm kind of often regarded as a glass half empty person, which I respond to that with, no, no, I just want to know what's in the glass, yeah. bros. <laughs> I want to know what's in it. Um, yeah. So anyway, but said she, she was throwing these stats at me like, oh, uh, fashion industry sales have gone down 75%. But tracky jacks, track pants sales have gone up 80%. In fact, track pant, track tops have gone up, up nearly 200%. Yeah. Track and bottoms so I'm, have gone down. <laughs> oh, tr oh, 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 yeah. <laughs> the trackies are going down. Well, that's, an, that's another thing happening on lockdown. But um, Can you I know, just ask I, you, so your, your book, you know, is about sand talk and you talk about patterns and i've seen you in your yeah, speeches yeah. using your hands very evocatively i was getting, I was getting to that <laughs> yeah so what's the pattern you're seeing well i mean you just you just start to think outwards and then you think uh and you think backwards too you so you're seeing the entire timeline in one go and you're thinking well what is the culture that drives the global fashion industry and we know what that is. It's, um, it's, it's uh, African-American males between the age of 13 and 24. Pretty much um, they drive the entire global fashion <laughs> industry. They're like the trendsetters. And what tradition is that coming out of? You know, it's coming out of a tradition of fa uh, slaves and former slaves working with uh, either uniforms or cast off clothing that was pretty much just the same for everybody and then tweaking those things in really creative ways to assert their individuality, you know? And that happens everywhere in your um, subordinate populations, your marginalized populations. These are the engines of creativity for the civilization, you know? So, well, my uncle Elvis, he started a trend once. Everybody was wearing the same bloody, um, you know, those flannel shirts. Anyway, he got his and he tied the arms around across like a sash was kind of looked like a toga and he was just walking around bare chested with it like that and that sparked a bit of a craze you know um yeah, this is how things happen so i just uh that leads me to wonder if um if you know with everybody experiencing that that everybody will experience a more kind of demotic engagement with fashion and will recover some agency in that instead of having it dictated to them by all these billionaires, what they're going to wear. Um, no girls, we don't want you in those business suits. We want frills. We want frills around your neck, <laughs> you know, and then they have to do it because that's what's being done. Instead of that, you know, imagine that reclamation that may start occurring as people try to go, Oh, everybody's wearing the same tracky decks or tracky tops. I'm going to uh, bedazzle this a little bit, or <laughs> you know, um, and then where does that spread with attitudes? When people enjoy a, a demotic reclamation of one part of the economy, um, 
you know, that, that becomes almost like a cottage industry, then where does that spread? What kind of black market economies emerge there? What kind of remittance economies? What kind of, um, you know, uh, different movements have sparked? And then what, what moves do the, the powers that be then make to try and uh, reclaim those areas of, of creativity and, you know, take it over and, and mass market it like garage grunge, you know, was destroyed uh, back in the 90s. <laughs> you know, I don't know. So you start thinking all these things. So you're seeing past, present and future at once all within a big web. And you're just seeing things that are interesting. You're not trying to predict stuff. You're just seeing interesting patterns. And that's a very nice place to be because you don't have to exist in discomfort all the time. If you're noting the things that are interesting and you're having a bit of a laugh, you know, so as I went through that whole picture, there are about four times when I said something that made me laugh, you know, um, just interesting little connections. Um, have a good laugh, note what's interesting and just move, move with the system, move around in it you know, individually, but uh, interact and allow your interactions to change you. And you're, it's all good. People trying to get together and control where the system's going to go by planning or trying to design a future or predict a future, all they produce is stagnation and entropy. And um, you want to avoid entropy at all costs. And I believe there's a little bit of a basin of attraction in the positive psychologies that gave rise to this new optimism. Um, that that attracts a kind of negative feedback loop uh, that creates stagnation and entropy. So you, um, yeah. So I think I think you're going in the right direction with your particular brand of optimism, you know, which is embracing uh, new ideas that you may not have words for yet, but that you feel um, intrinsically and intensely. Oh God, you've made my heart sing, Tyson. <laughs> um, can I pass you across to my friend Peter, who, who as well as being uh, one of my gurus in meditation, as I said, is, is deeply wedded to your writing. So Peter, you had a comment and some questions for Tyson? Um, thanks, Peter, and, and thanks, Tyson. I, I must commend you on the, the book. I think you've really given us a, a grounded template for the future, I think, with what you've put together in, in Sand Talk. I'm convinced that in in our culture, we, we think too much. You know, we spend too much time in our heads and, and you've provided us the means to get out of our heads and into our bodies and connect with country, connect with nature and connect with each other, which we don't do very well because we live separate lives in the main. How do, do you teach and, and um, enable pattern thinking to become gr a grounded part of our our society and is it, is this the secret to the future mm. well i guess it's in that idea of thinking and what it is um because in a lot of our cultures we we think of it more like we'd use the word feeling for it but the meaning that we would attach to the idea of feeling to that verb would be different from the anglo notion of feeling as, as emotive and emotions, because it's not really it. It's, it's feeling as a way of uh, transmitting and receiving knowledge through the spaces in between people and things, through that communicative uh, space. So it's something that sits in the relation between you and that tree or you and your cousin or you and the prime minister, you know, it sits in that space there and you kind of, your inductive, um, <laughs> process of inquiry um, uh, that you engage with in order to work with that knowledge is more along the lines of feeling than thinking. Um, it's no less intellectually rigorous. In, in fact, it's probably more intellectually rigorous. And I guess that's the thing that you're uh, pointing to and, and seeking there. Yeah. So in looking at the space between things, you're looking at the the relationships you, you in part of your book you, you talk about rather than focusing you you look with a gaze so almost with a blur as a means of detecting the relationships rather than the actual components is that the case yeah yeah and that's um that was the sequence that Noel Nana in Perth was was telling me about 
you know, so you kind of look three times, you know, you, you, you look first, the things, and then you ignore the things and you see the relationships between the things. But then you go one step further, you know, to be a great thinker. And you see the patterns of that those relationships form and where they're leading, you know, and then you can go into predictive sort of analysis um, uh, that just occurs very quickly, you know, if you're in that right mental state. And that's how um, you see I indigenous footballers always seem to be able to anticipate where the ball is going to go in play. And they just kind of magically like watch your next football game <laughs> or watch Curry knockout or something. And you'll see like um, your Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander player or Maori player or anything like that uh, just seems to appear <laughs> where the ball's gone when it goes somewhere strange, you know, because they've already positioned themselves because they're following that pattern. Yeah. So they're following the pattern. That, that's just the thing. Whereas I think... <laughs> In Western civilization, in, say in sport, people are taught skills, taught focus hard, taught this is what you're going to do. Whereas, I don't need a phone at this stage. Yeah. Uh, so um, people are taught too narrowly, whereas you're looking broadly, broadly at patterns mm. rather than narrowly at, at components. Yeah, yeah. Is that right? Yeah, that's it. So, and you're, I mean, basically what you're looking at in the pattern of those relations is you're, um, you're looking at flows, but you're not outside of the system observing those flows. You, you're actually within it. Yeah. And you're, you're a participant moving within those flows. Mm -hmm. So what happens is that you become part of a sentient system that is observing itself. Yeah. So you're receiving information from the whole at the same time as you're passing information uh, back to it and to every node in that system. It's, um, it's the kind of um, existential shift you have to make to become an appropriate custodian mm -hmm. and to know, you know, the things that you need to do that aren't going to have a butterfly effect or knock on that's going to mm -hmm. you know, cause a tornado in Texas or something, you know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's how that works. Um, yeah. And so you're experiencing these flows. So you're not just observing them, you're experiencing them. And because you're flowing with that pattern within those flows, then you have that. Now it's the same thing. Currencies operate in the same way. Uh, if they are, um, uh, if, if, if oligopolies and monopolies are avoided, and you experience an actual demotic um, free market economy, which I hope uh, industrial civilization might might experiment with one day. That would be good. Um, if you're within a con an economy like that, uh, such as the one that existed, um, you know, 200 years ago on this continent, you know, um, yeah, then the economic system works, and there is velocity there's a velocity of every unit or representative unit, you know, token within that economy, um, like the velocity of the dollar kind of thing. Um, yeah, but that's, we know this, you know, cause the word currency is like, um, that's from the Latin, which means to run or to flow, you know, currencies are flows. Um, money is a different thing. If you impose a monetary system over the top of a currency, um, then you are imposing an illusion, you know, that's meant to simplify the system and make it predictable, controllable and gameable um, by powerful players, you know, and arguably all of the stagnation that we're experiencing in the world and the entropy that we're experiencing and the insanity that every single one of us here is experiencing right now, arguably that's, that's been caused um, by power systems that have been placed over the top of us and over the top of our land and our economies and our communities uh, to break those things down and impose this illusion, you know, um, you know, replacing family and community with, with state and marketplace um, as if these things will just provide as if like the invisible phallus of the, of the, 
marketplace is going to sort us out. Um, I know they say a invisible hand, but I, I tend to think of it as an invisible prick. Um, because <laughs> it's not lifting us out of every, anything. It's not the rising tide that lifts all boats. It's a, it's a, it's a tsunami of, <laughs> of mediocrity and, um, you know, depression and uh, social fragmentation. Um, yeah. Oh, I know that sounds, are, people say that's, that's, that's pessimistic. pessimistic. Oh, that's pessimistic, glass half empty, but it's, no, no, that's what's in the glass. And, and we have to drink that right now. So I'm really glad that my glass is half empty because uh, I wouldn't want to drink a full glass of that one. <laughs> you, you make a really interesting point, Tyson, about, um, about science and the demand for objectivity, taking the observer out of the equation. Could you comment on that and how we might think more openly and in a more connected way? Yeah, well, I mean, it doesn't really work. You know, um, quantum physicists, for example, have had to completely abandon that notion <laughs> because nothing works. <laughs> you know, um, all data is contaminated. <laughs> we can stop dropping. Yeah. yeah, start moving away from that notion that, um, you know, our human presence in the field is not something that's dirty, <laughs> but that it's, it's good. It occupies an ecological niche in the system of any field that you're studying. Um, <laughs> So, you know, you are present. And like I said, you're part of a dynamic self-organizing sentient system that is observing itself. And, you know, and if you are of that system, then you'll probably, ha your observation will probably have minimal impact on it. But if you're trying as an outside observer, just your act of observing it will change it. Um, yeah, because that itself is a, um, it's an intervention. And, you know how we don't like interventions that much. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I guess it, it's just that uncertainty principle, which is a nice thing to think about in a time of uncertainty when, you know, people are trying to seek um, warm, fuzzy feelings um, when, they, when they peer into a, a future that's looking increasingly uncertain. Yeah. Um, also, with um, information and, and knowledge, um, too much of Western thinking is based on grasping knowledge and hanging onto it, protecting it, and using it for that better than attitude and a competitive attitude. Whereas in indigenous thinking, when you have knowledge, it's your responsibility to share it. Could you speak on that? Yeah. Yeah, it's your responsibility to share it when it's good knowledge and to let people know when it's not. And so there's a very rigorous um, process of inquiry that, that occurs um, in a healthy indigenous uh, community or not, uh, which happens all the time. These aren't static, fixed, stayed the same for X thousand years. Um, yeah, these, these new pieces of knowledge, these new items, uh, they have to be interrogated um, using a narrative process. So it's, it's looking at trying to dig down and see what the foundational story of that knowledge is, you know? So for example, if we were looking to take on reductionism, we would need to look right back to, you know, Aristotle and friends and, um, you know, really look at that story and we'd have to look at, um, okay. So I look back at that story and I see, I see Socrates, saying something and I see him mentoring Plato. So I start to get an idea of the genealogy of that idea. And then I see Plato then in turn mentoring Aristotle. And so I'm seeing that three generations there of where that knowledge has come from and what the story of that was. And then the big story situated in place of Aristotle, then mentoring Alexander the great and what he did with it, what he did with those ideas, with that reductionism and with that kind of um, abstract knowledge, the ability to separate an idea or concept from its context and just have it exist in isolation, you know, to take it, rebrand it, repackage it, value add, and then, um, 
and then scale it. <laughs> and I see a pattern there that's, that, that's had a no good effect on the world. You know, uh, anybody who met Alexander in his subsequent rampage East um, would have felt the sting of that, you know, because he, um, he, he, it wasn't, I mean, he wasn't taking resources like, um, like minerals and gold and things like that. You know, yeah, they got a bit of treasure to feed the army, um, but mostly what he was after was knowledge. And he was plundering the East for knowledge, but he only took the surface of it because he didn't understand anymore what knowledge was. Because knowledge is nothing when it's taken out of its web of relationships. Mm. When it's taken out of its relational context, it's nothing. And, it's, and he died uh, young, Tyson, remember? Yeah. He, he didn't have time to accumulate the wisdom. He, he exactly. died very young. Paul, do you want to go next? Yeah, yeah. Thanks very much, Victor. Sorry about the microphone. Nice to see you again, Tyson. Uh, hey, always... how are you, Paul? Yeah, good, mate. And great to hear your uh, wisdom. I've, I've got so many pithy quotes already from this session. Um, but one of the things you just said uh, quite early on uh, was the idea about uh, humour and the importance of humour. And yeah. it, it, it seemed to me that um, Indigenous culture um, has always had a sort of a larrikin aspect to it an ability to uh, make fun of itself and to kind of cut, cut to some um, fundamental truths. And I'm wondering, are there ways we can learn from um, Indigenous uh, cultural humour? Yeah, I think ask, um, ask the Irish. Ah. Ask, ask any, any Irish family that's been here for more than four or five generations. And, um, and you'll have that, you know, it's no accident that, that most of the Aboriginal family names you'll find are Irish. You know, they're all Kennedys and Kellys and ah, all kinds, you know. Um, yeah. So I, I, I'd say ask the Irish because that was um, a point, apart from the fact that your, um, you know, your early settler Irish um, uh, still had their Indigenous language and, and cultural practices and were able to, you know, embassy with us in that way and share their dances, share their stories, uh, share their language, you know, in that way with us uh, and sort of come in the right way as, you know, an indigenous people pretty much meeting an indigenous people and both, um, you know, uh, trying to survive the I I oppression of an imperial power, you know, bearing in mind that the Irish had been enslaved by the British for like 500 years, more 800 years of slavery they had, um, under the British. So they had a very good understanding of that. But one of the big points, apart from dance and song and everything and story, which they brought in bucket loads, was just that humour, that sense of humour, that, um, that larrikin. That there was a really good correlation between that and that. And so much emerged from that. You know, so Gaelic, Gaelic football uh, was shared. And then an, an Indigenous ball game was also shared. And out of that uh, dialogical kind of interface um, that was based around fun and enjoyment, out of that came Australian rules football, you know. So, uh, you know, yeah, I guess um, you could probably ask, ask, ask any Irishman uh, <laughs> in sort of yeah, yeah, I Victoria. <laughs> yeah. You know, go and out to Glen Rowan or something. Maybe I'm with that mob. Um, yeah, because we it, it's it's the it's the same one, and it was a real point of uh, contact and interest. Um, yeah, but, and if I may, just the quick flow on from that, I think is 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 around the storytelling tradition, isn't it? Mm. So, again, that probably goes possibly back to the Irish, but I think you guys have had it in your mob for, for uh, thousands of years, haven't you? Yeah, the story. Yeah. Well, I'm sure that's where we got the word yarning from from Irish. Mm. Either that or Cockneys, they had the same thing. Uh, but I do know. And this is going to be controversial, um, but I've heard lots of Irishmen, like in Ireland, using the word deadly a lot. Yeah. And I suspect we might have picked that up from them. Ah, oh, I wondered on that. Yeah. yeah. When people ask me where deadly comes from, I, I always like to tell them that it, it, it started in my house. But nah. <laughs> but um, no, I suspect uh, that's an Irish thing. You know, there's a lot of Australian culture people wouldn't even suspect, you know, came out of that, that, those, that early embassy 
you know, between the Irish and, uh, and um, Aboriginal peoples of Australia. Mm-hmm. Um, there's, a, there's a book, uh, no, there's a movie, Nightingale, if you haven't seen it. It's, it's about a, <clears throat> a, a Celtic woman uh, who was, you know, a convict um, or a free convict or something in Tasmania and her adventure, um, uh, you know, within within the the, the colony uh, with a with an Aboriginal um, uh, fella from there in, in Tasmania, and sort of their kind of meeting. Like he was, he didn't accept her for a long time because he just looked at her and went, "Well, you're one of them." And then he heard her speaking language, you know. Yeah. And I guess, and they, they, they ended up forming a really close alliance uh, and quite a beautiful relationship. It's, it's an amazing film and a bit disturbing, but it's really worth a look. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. Ralph, I think you, you had a question. <laughs> I think it's been answered a dozen times, actually. But uh, I, I, uh, I must say also that uh, to uh, Tyson, just how much I appreciated his book and I found really absolutely nothing to uh, argue with in it. Um, my own background is in agriculture and uh, I was very lucky to be one of the early rural science graduates from the University of New England under Prof McClymont where he uh, made our course based on agricultural ecology. And so we're looking at all these system inter- interrelationships and yet with the individual components of it, looking with reductionist technology at, uh, uh, to get down to the, the finer detail of, uh, of why a sheep grows wool or whatever you like to call it. And uh, so I, and a lot of my experience also has been in Asia and with Buddhist people, uh, particularly in Mongolia. And uh, again, I found Tyson that there are great similarities in my understanding of their thinking and what you proposed or what you were uh, exposing mm. in your book. And uh, as we've been talking here, um, uh, my wife, Adrian, who very appropriately is just below me on the screen here, of course, um, uh, we've been up here on the southern end of the Sunshine Coast for the last almost 20 years. And uh, of course, I've been doing a lot of gardening here and we're on what was called the Old Wallen country, which is uh, in, in Gobby yeah, Gobby country. Uh, that, and coastal and scrub. Coastal scrub, sandy soils. And uh, I've been spending this 20 years trying to build these soils up. And uh, just by, within the system that I have here, certainly bring in some fertilizer from outside, but mainly using just the grass clippings that I've been getting from our three quarters of an acre block. And uh, in your earlier discussion today, where you're saying things are basically going in cycles, that I know that I'm just a, a human manager interposing myself on this system, but I know that if I stop, within about 12 to 18 months, the soil has gone back to what it was originally. Mm. And, and so this gives a, a, a time component and the cycling, uh, the open-endedness of, uh, of this chaos system, I guess. Um, so uh, then I, I suppose in the questions, um, the, what came out of your book really hit me Um, on page 108 of your book, you're talking about spirits and spirituality and you're breaking the spirit uh, down into four components. And I I think that that is a a, a particularly interesting way of looking at life because, okay, we're brought up as Christians in our society. Application of reductionism too, really. Yeah. (laughs) It it just expands (laughs) your thinking enormously. And uh, I think that uh, because of that one particular point, there's so much for us to learn from the indigenous culture that you have been exposing. Hmm. Yeah. I don't know whether I put an actual question there. It's it's funny. It's it's just made me, no, it's really important what you just said, you know, because um, it it always troubled me, um, you know, naming and, and, and kind of listing those four parts of spirit. You know, um, because that, that, you know, we just, we don't do lists. We don't do, you know, um, 
you know, five things everybody can do to stop climate change or, you know what I mean? Yeah, um, yeah. Actually, know, I don't know whether all the other participants here have, have read your book or know what we're talking about with spirit. Can I just mention that you're talking about your higher spirit, which is your super ego that will die along with you. But you put in the book that it will go to heaven, wherever heaven might be in that stage. But the earth always reflects the heaven so that you've got your earth spirit, which is your ancestral spirit that takes you back through your ancestors to the knowledge that they had and also to what is going to be into the future, no doubt. And then the living spirit, which is what we have that just animates our body at the moment, which of course will totally disappear. And then uh, I love this one, the shadow spirit, which is your economic wants. And uh, it can get totally out of control at times, as we've seen yeah. in this market economy situation where a yeah. market economy just goes to greed in the end. Well, that's what I was about to explain, even though it troubled me making like a, a list like that and breaking that spirit up. I was worried that that would almost be a bit of a curse. <laughs> but I did a bit of a risk benefit analysis, you see, because <laughs> I, I could see the importance of, of having to explain to people what that shadow spirit is. Um, you know, particularly with a lot of the yarns I'm starting to come into now and that I've been trying to have for a long time um, to try and explain what it is that cyberspace is and, and why that cybernetic uh, interface with the world of spirit is troubling and problematic and what it is doing to our spirit, you know, because everybody feels something going wrong with them through these devices. And, you know, and I believe that it's that growing of the shadow spirit side of things and this kind of um, this storage of that spirit, like the cultural DNA of, of, of your ego um, being kind of uploaded to this, this, uh, this sort of false dreaming, this synthetic dreaming and, and held there forever. So instead of your shadow spirit dissipating over the course of a year, as it's supposed to do if the proper funerary rites are practiced and if nobody says your name or your image is not seen, you know, and if all your belongings are destroyed, that spirit will dissipate. But we've created this, uh, this purgatory, um, you know, for our data, which is kind of like our shadow. It's all our wants and needs and, and, and longings, all of our optimism, all of our pessimism, everything rolled into this howling, hating ball of narcissism that wants to live forever. And we've created this, this digital purgatory where all these horrible shadows can howl around forever, you know, even as we live. And then that part of your spirit needs to be in balance with the other four. Otherwise you get sick and you'll go just wamba, you know? So that's, and that's what's happening. This, this ego is taking over this narcissism, this shadow and um, knocking everything else out of balance. And all of us here, every single one of you and me included is absolutely insane right now. You know, where we've got these weird operating protocols that have just been installed, you know, without our consent and without our knowledge. And um, yeah, it's, um, I came into this world with great reluctance in 2016 when I got my first mobile phone um, because everybody else was there. And I just spent the last decade watching everybody go insane. And, um, you know, and as great as it could be for me to stand apart from that, and feel myself to be greater than, which I was starting to feel, you know, that's, uh, it was a pretty lonely place to be. So I came in and um, yeah. And I'm pretty sure my cognitive capacity has been reduced by about 75% since I picked up that phone. That's fascinating. You know, yeah. um, Tyson, <laughs> the statistics show that during that same period you referred to, um, diagnosed and medicated anxiety and depression in Australia has doubled. Mm. So I think that, you've nailed that it. That was a numbers game too. Oh, that's true. That, that was based on the, the numerical kind of, um, you know, uh, predictive technologies that were created. So, um, you know, coming out of game theory in the 1950s, 
which was developed to try and uh, respond to the arms race. Um, you know, coming out of that, that early period, I mean, game theory is a bit different now. It's, it's evolved. But what it was before coming out of that uh, was this idea of, of the human as the machine, as something that was predictable and had a set of genetic behaviours. Uh, that was supported by research on Indigenous people. Um, uh, the Yanomani, um, you know, in, in the Amazon, you know, this guy was uh, watching their fights and he, he determined, <laughs> he, he, he used a computer to figure out all the genealogies in, in the thing. And he said, well, these people are too primitive to understand their own gene genealogies. They couldn't possibly hold all that information in their heads, but they're still behaving in these fights with protective interests towards people that they're related to, who they couldn't possibly know that they're related to consciously because, you know, this is a primitive society. <laughs> And so it made the, it made the conclusion from that uh, of the, the, it was the germ of this selfish gene idea so that we are actually driven just by our genes and that this can be computed, this can be predicted. And, um, and that, that, that went up and that went through everything. So um, everything went to forms then. So people are filling in forms, you know, um, are you often angry? Do you eat at two o'clock in the morning? <laughs> Does your weight fluctuate? You know, so they had all these, they reduced uh, mental imbalance down to a set of symptoms. <clears throat> and they figured if they could, they could dissipate those forms out to everybody, those surveys, then they could, um, they could diagnose this illness like that. So knowledge devoid of context, once again, you see? So you're not seeing the context of, well, you know, her granny just died, so she's upset. <laughs> and that's normal, bros. That's not a mental illness. Look at the context, for God's sake. Look at the context of what's happening all around us in this world. Anybody who's not feeling a bit mentally ill right now is, is insane. <laughs> I mean, that <laughs> it would be a worry to me to meet somebody who, who wasn't feeling uh, quite mentally imbalanced right now. If you're <laughs> not mentally imbalanced right now, then you're out of touch with the world. And you're no longer living in this system with the humans, you know. Uh, or I'm surrounding myself with optimists. Um, so see, Jeff Kerr Bell wanted to throw a question at you. Okay, and then we'll get back to the numbers game because that story continues. Okay. And, um, yeah. Jeff. Yeah, um, Tyson. Um, as as I mentioned, I'm from New Zealand. I've got Maori heritage um, as well as white heritage and French and a whole bunch of other stuff as well. Um, like most people, a bit of a mongrel. Um, but but the interesting thing is I also um, studied while, while doing business, I also uh, did an elective in ancient history um, and archaeology um, and, uh, and I've always liked rocks. Um, so the concept of time, the concept of this magnificence of time and our insignificance in the whole scheme of things um, is also present in Maori culture as well. Um, the idea of being part of the land, um, the relationship between time and, and, uh, and, and cycles and our humanity and the involvement with that and time. Um, and I think one well, of the other things about uh, uh, Japanese culture is they celebrate the shortness of life. Um, mm. So again, it's this concept of appreciating the insignificance we have in the grand scheme of things. So my question is in terms of, and, and interestingly you said you're the wrong person and talk about optimism at the beginning, um, which I think is quite funny because you've been, uh, again, like, uh, like Victor made me extremely optimistic with some of your statements. Um, that funny dichotomy between um, having the context to see the negative, but also seeing the positive out of it. Um, I mm. think that's that, that wonderful thing about the optimism mm. um, in, in the pessimism almost. Uh, but my question is, I guess, the, um, that concept of time, um, um, our significance in it, and a relationship to, to the world around us in other Indigenous cultures. Have you explored that um, in, in, in what can you tell us about other, other cultures and that relationship? Yeah. Well, I think you just told us a lot. So, you know, the, the arrow of time gives, gives rise to this horrendous fear of mortality. Um, and, and, and that's kind of relieved by this little panacea that's been introduced through civilizations of the idea of an afterlife, of a heaven that you go, go to. So you can, no matter what's happening to you in your life, you can optimistically look forward to, if you follow the rules, that you get to go to this lovely place and sit on the clouds forever. You know, um, 
whereas the Japanese, you know, have this powerful thing and, and I'm sure they probably have a word for it. And it's the feeling that you're all having, that you're having to call optimism, but really isn't, you know, uh, where they can, they're intensely aware of their own mortality. And, um, and they see the cherry blossom fall as they will fall. And it is beautiful. And it is beautiful because it changes, you know, because it changes form and moves on. Um, and so they make meaning. They're writing poetry about those cherry blossoms. You know, your, your genuine engagement with reality and acceptance, acceptance of things like mortality, this is what produces aesthetics. This is what produces every great human innovation and, and just the, the amazing things that the human brain can do, the enormous creativity. It all comes out of that acceptance of the real. If you go into a denial of that reality and give in to hope, then you're killing that creative engine of creation and you're, you're stifling your ability to return to um, your role as a, a, as a member of a custodial species, you know, hope is, hope is, hope is part of the tool of our enslavement, you know, and optimism is the whip that makes us work harder, you know, uh, towards the goals of our masters, you know, so I would really strongly suggest that that feeling, that intense feeling that you're all having, that you're having to call optimism because this language doesn't afford us any other way of saying it. I would say that's a different feeling, you know, cause I'm seeing like, I mean, this, this is the best questions I've ever heard in one of these things. So you're an intensely like unusually strong group of people around sense making and meaning making. And you've no doubt many of you have heard of the crisis of meaning that's happening. Mm -hmm now because the institutions that have done that for us and told us the meanings we're supposed to make, that those institutions have crumbled and we do no longer trust them. So now there's a crisis of meaning. And for some people that causes them to lose hope. For other people, it's a source of inspiration. Ooh, what meaning can I make now? You know, and that's not looking to some future point that Oh, I hope one day I can make meaning. I know it. I will. I have faith that one day I'll be able to make. Meaning. It's like, wow, what meaning can I make now? You know, and you're all coming up with these amazing questions, which are more like provocations because the answer is in the question, you know, and um, <laughs> it's just, this is the best yarn. It's the best yarn I've had for a long time. Well, we've Actually, saved the, the best. Uh, it is. It is the um. It is about the cherry blossom. There is a word, and I just couldn't remember it. But yes, it, it's related to the cherry blossom. So the celebration of the shortness of life. The word is related to the fact that the cherry blossom falls. You know, it, it flowers once or you know for only a couple of days a year, and so it's short. So it's related to that that uh, sense of time and and the shortness of it, and celebrate it. Celebrate the creativity of humanity in in its shortness of. of What's existence. the word? I can't remember what it is, but uh, okay. Find out that word. I'll find it. <laughs> and, 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 and we might start using that. I'd be interested to hear what it is. Adrian has a question, I think, Victor. Oh, good. Adrian? <clears throat> Sorry. My, my question was really to do with pattern thinking, and it's a bit away from the line we've been following. But as a teacher, I have had a lot to do with uh, Indigenous students in the mainstream system, where they very quickly become disengaged and is this because the thinking and, and i feel it is because the think, thinking systems are, are entirely different and that a lot of what we present to these students is really not even relevant to their life mm. and yeah. there has to be some way of improving the existing um, education system <clears throat> so that it becomes relevant to the indigenous students and I would think much more relevant to many of our, many of the non-indigenous students, particularly boys who, you know, need a whole different method of learning. Mm. Um, and so I just would like you to make some comment on that, please. Well, um, I believe that students uh, in this education system 
they they lost faith in the ability of this institution to make meaning or to transfer genuine meaning uh, to them. Some state, some state in about the late eighties, I think the last ones came through who were actually engaging, you know, mm. appropriately and intellectually and with agency and rigor, you know, with the education system. And mm. that was by no means everybody, but there was still a few then. Um, yeah. So I think what we've had is, um, is just basically three decades and I guess, you know, you look at the last three decades, everything's happened then, you know, from Reagan and Thatcher onwards. Um, you know, the world was quite deliberately changed. You know, a, a new economic system was imposed, but they needed that to be a cultural system as well. So they needed, in order for people to conform to that, um, that idea of people with mm -hmm. genes with predictable behaviours, they needed to shape people into that and they needed those people to self monitor and have KPIs that they were signing off on and all these kinds of things. So they needed to change the culture. So any um, information or knowledge presented in schools became quite disingenuous, yeah. you know, where before at least individual teachers uh, had discretionary powers to actually make meaning and to discover knowledge with their students. Mm -hmm. You know, there was still some good learning coming through every school would have at least one teacher like that, mm. but then that was just regulated out of existence, yes. you know? So all, all learning became propaganda in that 30 year period. Um, all learning became a rote learned propaganda and it also mm. became a way of um, uh, patterning students into producing, you know, basically the product isn't knowledge of education institutions. The product is workers, you know, uh, it's mm. obedient subordinated workers you know, who, um, who have mastered the habit of, um, of suppressing every instinct they have, every question they might have, and just being able to focus completely on the meaningless task in front of them and do it for eight to 12 hours mm. and then, um, you know, go home without killing anybody. <laughs> yeah, I think I, I definitely agree with um, that. that, that. That's it. So yeah. students don't trust us anymore. And young people, young people aren't stupid because they're not, they're not completely gone over into this way of thinking instead of feeling, feeling as inquiry. So they still have feeling as inquiry and they may not have the language to express it, but they know bullshit when they see it. Yeah. And, um, and classes have been unmanageable, you know, for at least mm -hmm. two decades, mm -hmm. um, you know, and increasingly we teach to the test. That's, that's been replaced because that's part of that numbers game that I mentioned earlier. Uh, we're teaching to the test and increasingly get trying to get students to think like machines. I think they've realized that they're not going to be able to create an AI that replicates uh, human cognition because they don't understand human cognition. So they don't even know what human consciousness is yet, this, this globalizing culture. So they're not going to be able to replicate it. So they decided it would be easier instead to turn people into robots. Have you noticed <laughs> they haven't actually changed? The tech hasn't changed very much or uh, mm. grown very much in your, um, you know, your automated robot voice. You know, when you talk to a robot on the phone, mm. do you remember how hard that used to be? The robot couldn't understand you and would, mm. do you mean, and you're like, no, I don't mean that. Um, but have you noticed how much easier it's become? And you think, oh, the tech must have improved. No, it didn't. We've just learned how to talk like machines. <laughs> <laughs> so we are interfacing. <laughs> well, Tyson, you've been so generous. It, it's, we've been 55 minutes and you only met us last week for the first time. So your generosity is just mm -hmm. astonishing. And, and my heart is lifted by everything I've heard from you today. <laughs> so I wonder, um, Peter, if I can ask you to, to do the thank you and the wind up and to ask Tyson, what is the, the last message he's going to leave with this group of optimists? And I hope he's going to visit with us again. Oh, Peter? Gee. Yeah, thanks very much, Victor. Thanks, everybody. It's been, uh, been just stunning, I think. Uh, I'd love for this to continue, Tyson, if we could do it again. We haven't even got to that wonderful Prussian education system. Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> Don't start me up. <laughs> well, we got to the effect. We just didn't look too much at the causes. Yeah. Yeah, but could I, Tyson, just on behalf of everybody to thank you so much uh, and personally to commend you on that book. As I said at the start, that is a template that we should pick up and apply and make our society better and help uh, help everybody to connect. Mm -hmm. Now, Victor's um, question was, what is your, what are your parting words? Uh, just parting words would be reflecting on um, uh, the connection that he mentioned um, there and, and, and how smoothly that, that's gone because of it, that relationship. Um, yeah, but I'd say that's a set of pre-existing conditions and genealogies that have brought us all here. I think there's a, um, there's a kind of siblinghood among people who are um, engaging with good thinking. And, um, you know, <laughs> we know each other already. You know it when you see it. And um, yeah, so I thank you all for that because I've, um, like I said, this is the best yarn I've had for a good long time. Your Carson, would we, would we be able to do this again? Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. Well, we hope you enjoyed that Optimism Cafe. Um, I was inspired by it. I hope you were too. Um, please um, join the Centre for Optimism. You can subscribe for free or you can support us by taking up a membership but we'd love you to be a part of what we're doing, an optimism movement um, spreading infectious optimism around the world.